When the cinematic teaser for Elder Scrolls 6 came out, the big question was, where was it located? The land is such that it could be one of many different options, two of which the majority of people have sided with, those being either High Rock or Hammerfell, two of the greatest possibilities for the next iteration of the game, both being pretty good choices overall. It is no secret that I would have rather it be elsewhere, in Elsewhere for example. There is just something about the Khajiit land that inspires me from all the different types of catfolk that exist, not just the type we get to see in Skyrim, to the exploration of some of the Khajiit gods, like the video I did about Lorca, and of course, the complex political system that has a cat with a gigantic unnatural mane as its leader. It's too cool. But alas, we get High Rock, possibly. The westernmost province on the mainland of Tamriel, a land of temperate climates and soft rolling hills, split in half by the towering Rothgarian mountains. The quaint charm of its hamlets and the austere grandeur of its cities speak of a gentle life, something that was only a distant dream for most of the long, peculiar history of the Bretons. Because I am of the belief that the teaser has the higher chance of it representing High Rock rather than Hammerfell, I'm going to start with this video, exploring 5 things that you probably didn't know about this land far to the west. Let's go! Number 1 High Rock is gorgeous. That would probably be the first thing you would notice if they were to make the game here. Fertile soil, the clement weather, beautiful vistas, and vibrant glades. The place was so inspiring that it ended up not only attracting multiple races and tribes, but it even ended up attracting the gods themselves. It was here in High Rock where the gods built their one gathering place, a place where they could meet in order to discuss important issues. You might recognize the name of the place from various lore books throughout Skyrim, or if you generally delve deep into the lore of Elder Scrolls. The place is a tower, and it's called the Adamantia, better known, however, for its other two names, the Dyreni Tower or the Adamantine Tower. You might not know that it was indeed here where the gods got together before leaving this world, to convene one last time and discuss matters of importance. Specifically, the matter at hand was what to do with Lorcan. It was here where it was decided that Lorcan was to be punished by removing his heart and imprisoning him here in the mortal world. Lorcan's heart was removed from his body and shot towards the east, where it landed far and transformed into the Red Mountain. If the game is indeed set in High Rock, then it is guaranteed that this tower will form part of the main quest, in one way or another. It is literally one if not the singular most powerful place in all of Tamriel, inside of which is believed to be a portal that no one has been able to activate. They call this portal the Argent Aperture, which lays locked behind a metallic door locked with 13 slowly counter-rotating rings. Some of the most powerful and knowledgeable wizards in history have tried to open it without success, a process that renders the wizard typically with tremendous scars and wounds, and most times without life. Indeed, the line that guards the tower is called the Dyreni family, a very powerful line of scholars, wizards, and warriors. To put it into perspective, if Mani Marco created necromancy, these guys basically created enchanting, alchemy, and conjuration. They are a big deal, and in fact, one of them back in the day formed part of the original Sijic order. Just giving you some context for when I say that even though these guys are clearly superior to the vast majority of the world when it comes to magic, they haven't been able to open opened this portal since they found it, all the way since the first era, thousands of years ago. Whenever one of their wizards gets of age, they record everything that they know about magic and about their discoveries, and they finally enter the tower and move down to the foundation vault, where the Argent Aperture is located. Most never come back left completely mangled and destroyed by the protections of the portal. What fits the magic of the tower is a peculiar artifact called the Zero Stone, literally made by the gods, suffused with infinite power that no one has been able to tap. Number 2 Probably the most important thing to know about High Rock would be its inhabitants, specifically the Bretons. You might not know that these guys never truly conquered the province, at least not with sword and magic. Instead, surprisingly, through resilience and commerce. See, originally we know that beast folk used to live here, though exactly which kind of beast folk is very difficult to tell. I'm not talking about Argonians or Khajiit, I'm talking about a range of literal monsters to more interesting varieties of creatures like the Lilmothit, which are thought to be now 
now extinct. Imagine Khajiits, but instead of cat-based, vulpine-based, like, like fox people. If the game were to be set here, we would see an entire new ensemble of monsters and intelligent beast-like creatures. Creatures with their own culture, though probably a suboptimal level of intelligence, since we know that these beastmen never actually ended up creating permanent settlements. Think like the giants in Skyrim or the goblins in Cyrodiil, though probably a large number of new, unseen types of creatures. The elves came to High Rock and settled here, very easily clearing the beast folk away with their superior weapons and magic. They ended up completely dominating the province and absorbing the humans that would come to migrate there later on down the line. The greatest clan to come out of this were the Dareni family, which we just spoke about. Their power was so great here that High Rock was actually named Dareni Hegemony. They basically owned all of High Rock, parts of Skyrim, parts of Hammerfell, and parts of Cyrodiil until eventually they overreached and throughout the next centuries they ended up losing all of their land. The ones who ended up obtaining their land were the very quiet Bretons, the offspring of the intermingling between the elves that dominated the land and the humans that would migrate here from all over the world, the result of the two which you might call half-elves. When the empire of the elves came crashing down, the ones to pick up the pieces were the very successful fishing villages and mercantile harbor towns of the Bretons. The Nords and the Nedic people from Syria Deal preferred trading with the Bretons, which formed friendships and partnerships. Partnerships that grew these small fishing towns into commercial hubs, which later on turned into small kingdoms. And as such, the places as we know it was formed. High Rock. This is why, on a first glance, High Rock is intrinsically different from Skyrim and Cyrodiil, in the sense that even though it is a singular province, it is in no way a singular government. High Rock is not ruled by a single individual, but by multiple kings and queens. During Skyrim, even though the province was divided, the whole point of the civil questline was to produce a high king, a person that the entire province would follow. In High Rock, what we would find would be a collection of different kingdoms, all with their own costumes, traditions, and mannerisms. The total, as it stands now, shows us a total of five whole kingdoms. Though, since we are not sure how far into the future Elder Scrolls VI is going to be, it is difficult to tell if we will have more or less kingdoms by then. Number 3. If you follow Elder Scrolls lore, you might notice that Bethesda loves to throw curveballs when it comes to the recollection of events in this world. You might have an in-game book that will say one thing and then another book that will contradict it completely. Most of this is because characters' perspective on things are kept real a lot of the time, and just because a historian might believe something to be true doesn't actually mean that it is indeed true. There are, however, entire moments in time where events change dramatically depending on who is retelling the tale. There are cultures that will swear that they saw gods walking the earth, while others do not. What actually happened in Red Mountain when the Dwemer disappeared? Nobody knows. Some people say one thing, while other people say completely opposite things. Were there Nords there? Some people say that there were, others say that there weren't. Were the Kimmer and the Dwemer working together? Some say that they were, some say that there weren't. Who made the Dwemer disappear? Even that much is disputed. We don't actually know if it was Kagranak with his tools, or if the tribunal was directly responsible. We don't know anything. There are many moments such as these in the lore of Elder Scrolls, important events that are clouded in mystery. They are such because they were victims of a dragon break. To keep it simple, a dragon break is a distortion of time and space, a temporal phenomenon that involves a splitting of the natural timeline which results in branching parallel realities, where the same events occur differently or not at all, or all together at the same time, even if they contradict each other. Now that's a mouthful, but here, imagine this as playing a video game that has multiple endings, where the game says that all endings are canon. But how can all endings be canon if you can choose which ending you want? It doesn't matter, the game will find a way to make all endings true and canon, even if they all contradict each other. This is a dragon break. Why this happens is unknown, though every once in a while when something huge is about to happen, typically when a, when a single decision can and will change the very fabric of the world is in place, then a dragon break tends to occur when it makes all decisions real. Probably some form of failsafe by Akatosh, the god of time, to prevent a single decision from from changing the world too much. But honestly, 
Who knows? What you might not know is that one of the biggest and most well-known dragon breaks actually happened in High Rock, what is known to us as the Warp in the West. This was the result of the ending of Elder Scrolls II, Daggerfall, where the main character got access to a weapon of mass destruction, the Dwemer Golem Numidium. The main character had to choose who to give this golem to or more specifically, who to give the ability to manipulate this golem to. His options included a plethora of powerful kingdoms and people. Whoever were to gain access to this golem would use it to basically further their own agendas and goals, to become more powerful. In this moment in time, every decision that the player had access to became canon, all became real. And the result of all of these branching timelines merging together resulted in what is known as the miracle of peace by the people of the land. See, we know that it was a dragon break, but the actual people that live in the game, in the video game, do not know that it was a dragon break. To them, reality happened to them in very different ways. John might say that the sky was blue, whereas Brian might say that the sky was red. Reality was real for each of them, but they all experienced and lived something entirely different. At the end of which was the miracle of peace, where everybody lost a day, but in the end, like the name suggests, peace was finally accomplished. See, before the dragon break, there were literally 44 independent kingdoms in the province, all trying to fight each other for land. After the dragon break, there were only four kingdoms and the orc city. Each of them had a lot more land and were considerably more powerful. The dragon break seemingly instead of allowing one person to dominate possibly the whole world with the weapon of mass destruction, instead it gave everyone the weapon, so that each of them would cancel each other out, to the point where only four and a half kingdoms were left. Keep in mind again that this all happened literally overnight, like magic. Boom, there were only four kingdoms instead of 44. That is the power of a dragon break. And that is the problem of giving a game multiple endings, Bethesda. They all become real. Number 4. I have seen far too many excited fans at the prospect of visiting or just generally having a stronger contact with the orcs if the game is indeed set in High Rock. Of course, we all know that the great orcish city of Orsinium is located within the Vrothgavian Mountains that divide High Rock. What you might not know is that unfortunately, this is probably no longer the case. In fact, more than likely, it is not the case. As of just about a hundred years before the events of Elder Scrolls Skyrim, the city of Rosinium was laid waste once again by the combined forces of both High Rock and Hammerfell. The city of Rosinium was completely destroyed and sacked. To top it all off, the loading screen in Skyrim mentions that the city of Rosinium is no longer in High Rock, but instead, it is located in a series of mountains between Skyrim and Hammerfell, clearly alluding to the fact that the orcs actually abandoned High Rock after the siege and resettled in the Dragontail Mountains, a series of mountains known to already harbor a large concentration of orcs. This means that if Elder Scrolls VI is indeed in High Rock, we would probably only find small settlements and outposts, similarly to how we encounter orcs in Skyrim albeit they would probably be a lot more aggressive in High Rock. Though it does open the game to the possibility of exploring those rich and interesting orc ruins, similar to how we explore ancient Nordic temples or Dwemer ruins in Skyrim. Exploring a dead orc city full of orc ghosts might be pretty epic indeed. Now if the game is actually set in Hammerfell, then we would most definitely see the new Orsinium in place. Number 5. Not much is currently known about High Rock as it stands in the present day. All the information that we have comes from whatever the characters tells us in Skyrim. Even this information could be useless to us because Elder Scrolls VI could be set hundreds of years in the future, so whatever we think we know could completely change by then. That being said, we do have an interesting bit of information about Wayrest, what could very well be considered the biggest and strongest city in High Rock. It seems that literally only 10 years before the events of Skyrim, the jewel of the bay, Wayrest, was completely destroyed by pirates. That's because the present king, King Barinia, knew that the Dark Brotherhood intended on killing him. There was a plot to end his life, so to counteract the plot, the king purposefully contacted and opened the gates for the pirates, allowing them full access into the city for them to plunder and destroy, with the main purpose of them destroying and killing every single Dark Brotherhood member in the city. Now, why is this important, you might ask? Well, if Elder Scrolls VI is actually set in High Rock, it means that there will be no Dark Brotherhood presence in it, at least not a strong presence. The Brotherhood Sanctuary in Wayrest was the only sanctuary in High Rock, 
and we know that it was completely destroyed and that everyone in it was killed. It also tells us that pirates and corsairs will be very prominent in the game, and we might also deal with a capital city being completely destroyed. But this is virtually the only information we have as far as the present day shenanigans happening in this province. It is not much, but it is indeed interesting nonetheless. Hope you'll enjoy this video and look forward to the sibling I will be making for Hammerfell. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters Anthony Dial, Wyatt Curlin, Toby Oliver, Dylan Baker, Casey Butler, and Derek Miller for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. Thank you all so much for supporting me and for helping me make these videos. Your help is greatly appreciated. Have a wonderful week, you guys.